Ladies and gentlemen, now hosting the Rizzo cast, put your hands together for Steven Risotto. What is going on, everybody, and welcome. This is episode number 92 of Rizzo Cast. I'm Steven Risotto, and today we are joined by none other than a, uh, a former big leaguer who played in parts of three seasons with the St. Louis Cardinals and the Miami Marlins. He's a current MLB Network radio host and the host of the Bigs podcast, also an analyst on ESPN's baseball coverage and has worked for the Cardinals as a diversity, inclusion, and equity consultant. He does like a million other things. Like I can't even tell you how much this guy does. He's all over the place. It is Xavier Scruggs. Xavier, thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me, Steven. Happy to be here. Excited to uh, to dive into the conversation with you, man. Appreciate it. And, and happy new year, man. I mean, it's it's it seems like, you know, we're so fresh into the new year, but it's only, you know, it's it's January 7th already. It's pretty crazy. It's crazy, man. Happy New Year to you. It's it's like you, you never know because how fast our time like moves. You never know when to stop saying Happy New Year, you know, but it's still fresh, like you said. Yeah, that's going to be my last Happy New Year. So <laughs> you're the recipient of it. Uh, right. So you just did a series and this is a pretty cool series on, on your YouTube and social media pages. Um, top 25 players under 25 uh, and you know, it's a very long list of productive players that are very young in today's game. And I think it's definitely a positive uh, for the future. And there's so many players and there are, sorry, there's so many media and uh, people around the game that are saying, you know, hey, I grew up in the Griffey and Bonds era and the steroid era. And, you know, back when there's all these complete players. But no, this era tops that in their mind. So I think it's it's definitely interesting. I mean, how difficult was it to piece together a list like that? Because there's really no right answer uh, or wrong answer, I should say. Uh, so how difficult was it to, to kind of put together that list? Uh, I mean, I think that's the beauty of the list, right? Is like we all have different opinions. And for me, I wanted to create some lists that like, cause some controversy, you know, and allow people to open up their opinions, allow people to think about how they feel about a certain player and their perspective. Um, and that's why I created these, man. I'm, I'm like, I'm sick and tired of kind of like the same old list that we always throw out there, right? Like top 10 first baseman, top 10, um, you know, uh, who we expect to be most valuable player, whatever it may be. I was like, let me do something just different. And with this top five under 25 I felt like this is another way we celebrate the game and how young and vibrant it is and how exciting these players are and I think you mentioned a great point right is like everybody it, it, there's no wrong answer with this but then also all these players have come up like so versatile as players and they're not just like in one box and I think that's what's special about our game today we see how important it is to be have flexibility, to have versatility, to be extremely athletic. Um, so that's what that's what I wanted to do, man. I was excited to do it. And it made me think about like what makes our game extremely special. And really, it's these young players. Yeah. And, and the other guys you mentioned are all, you know, pretty fresh in our mind. I mean, you mentioned Tatis, who is in the MVP voting. Guerrero finished second. Uh, Franco just got the big deal. Um, and, uh, I'm, I'm leaving out Soto who finished in the MVP voting. Uh, but there's one guy that we kind of haven't heard from in a while. And video came out of, of him taking some hacks in the batting cage, Ronald Acuna. We haven't seen him in a long time. And, you know, some fans might forget about Ronald Acuna, which is a shame, but <laughs> he's just as good as all of them, despite the ACL injury. And I believe he's going to come back strong. I'm sure you feel the same way. Absolutely. He could be possibly the best player on this young list of, of players. And the, the thing is, I'm even more excited to see because before he got hurt, we're talking about a 40 40 player. And, and we don't talk about that very often nowadays. We have guys with speed and power uh, uh, combination. But when you talk about Ronald Acuna, he's almost like in a league of his own. And so I'll be interested to see how he bounces back. 
I think physically he comes back stronger because a lot of times when you have those injuries as a young player, it makes you really dive into your body and figure out, okay, where are my inefficiencies in my body? He's going to make those things stronger. The big thing I wonder about is, is how it affects his speed, right? There might be some uh, hesitation to still steal as many bags as he has had in the past or go as hard as he's had. Um, but I, I, I don't think that stops him from being a top player in our league. 100% and the, the Braves like completely bounced back from that and you know they had the infield that played basically every day and they had the the three guys acquired at the deadline uh, and then they ended up winning the World Series but no he's going to be back strong I agree uh it, you also did a most exciting list and you had uh Shohei Otani ranked pretty high I don't want to give any spoilers uh <laughs> but you know we all have our own interpretations of what he did and you know the common factors just it was so amazing to watch uh, him go out there and pitch every week and, you know, drop 40 bombs. And it was a, it was kind of a once in a generational um, performance. And I think, you know, it, is it is it unfair to expect the same from him next year? Or is it like, is that now the <laughs> expectation? Do we raise the bar too high, Xavier? The, the bar is extremely high for Shohei Otani. And I think that's the debate, right? Because you look at a lot of the people that, we're trying to decide whether or not he deserved to be MVP um, that you look at almost what he did on the mound and what he did together as an athlete uh, offensively. Um, does he need to do the same in order for him to be MVP again? Do we, does he need to, if he does a little bit lesser, can he still have that opportunity? I think that's where we get in a little bit of that discussion and what we expect from him. Now we know what he's capable of doing. So the fact that we know that we're going to naturally expect him to be that type of player year in and year out, because the years before were extremely disappointing from what we were hearing dudes coming over from Japan. He's going to be the most exciting player we've seen doing both things. We didn't get to see him do both for a few years. And now we see him do both for the first time. And he blew our minds away. Like this was absolutely ridiculous in what he did. But what I love most about Otani is his ability to still be like, take, take all that stardom and still be able to just be himself. And I think that tells you a, a lot about the type of personality that he is coming from a different country, now getting comfortable and taking on the stardom like it's like it's no big deal. I, I love it. And we've seen the videos of him walking the dugout and like picking up trash and like <laughs> saying hello to people. And it's like, yeah, you're right. He hasn't lost who he is. And he's fit uh, for it. He's he fit, is for, fit it. for it. Exactly. A hundred percent. And, you know, he's someone who I believe has not even reached his pinnacle on the mound. We haven't seen mm. the best of Shoei Otani on the mound. Hey. I mean, he's got the wipeout split That's strong, the fastball. So yeah, I mean, Hey, no traditional takes here. That's for sure. We go <laughs> hot takes all the time. And the best part of all those guys that we just mentioned, Franco and Vlad and Soto, Tatis Acuna, Otani, they are all international stars. And yeah. not one of them was born in the United States. And, you know, I I'm sure that that you've you've been able to dive into a lot of this stuff with your with your gig with the Cardinals. But how important is that for baseball to be able to market them worldwide? Uh, and kind of explain the, the the meaning behind the international factor, because it's absolutely huge for these countries to get represented. Oh, man, it's it's monumental. And baseball, Major League Baseball itself would be dumb not to use this as an opportunity to be able to market across the world, all over the world with how great the sport has when it comes to talent. And I think that's one thing you don't have a lot of other sports that have the same international talent as our sport. Um, and, and, you know, you mentioned a great thing with the Cardinals and diversity and inclusion is like one of the biggest things I'm trying to do is have people understand that everybody comes from different perspectives, right? And, and that's what we have to be cognizant of. We don't have to always like it, but I have to understand that, you know, if you take a, a chance and, and live in somebody else's shoes for a minute, like, for example, like I, for the five players on my list um, of uh, top five under 25 are Dominican. And for me, like if a lot of our sport is Dominican, I, I like I wanted to go down to the Dominican during my time in the minor leagues, which I did twice and figure out, OK, what are they doing down there? That's totally different than what I'm experiencing in the United States, because obviously they're doing something right. 
And so my opportunity to go down there and kind of live in their shoes and, and experience their culture gave me a whole new eye-open experience to say, man, like I, I can be doing some things differently as, as in the United States, as they are doing there, I can appreciate things differently because of what I have that they don't have. And I'm always encouraging people to kind of look from a different point of view. And without that point of view, you don't understand why somebody acts a certain way or, or goes about their business a certain way. And I think that's what's so special about our game today is we get to see all those different perspectives, all those cultural backgrounds, all those experiences put together in one pot. And I think that's where you see the excitement of our game. And that's why our game can't just be one way. Love historians, love old school guys, but our game is going to evolve and change all the time because of the different perspectives we have in it. Yeah. And I think, you know, that there's a lot of people that are upset about the, the excitement in baseball today, that the emotions that are shown on the field and a lot, a lot of the players that are doing it um, have earned that right in my mind. You know, they've, they've traveled so far to get to, to the big league level. And uh, I honestly, it's just, if you take a picture of 450 to dead center field, like flip your bat. I mean, I'm sorry if right. you, that that gives the pitcher the right to pip, pump his fit. I almost said pimp his fist, pump <laughs> his fist after a big strikeout. I think that that equals out. What do you think? Absolutely, man. I did 100 percent. And part of it, too, is because, like, if you want guys to be their authentic selves, you have to expect them to, to feel like the field is where they can be themselves. They shouldn't have to hold back whatsoever. And I think, and I think too, with our game, as much as those things are starting to evolve, like our game is still seen outside of the baseball industry as being boring, as being like a stalemate game, as being a game that takes too long and there's no emotion, there's no flashiness. So even the strides that we're taking still show us that we have a long way to go before our game is seen in a different light by people outside of, of, of being normal viewers of our game, normal fans of our game, um, normal audience. And I think it, we're making the right strides, but we still have so much more to go. And in kind of a related point to the diversity and inclusion um, conversation, I mean, another aspect is that we have a lot of young um, statistically, we have a lot of young black players that we're losing to basketball and football over the years. And I'm sure you've kept up with this and the Players Alliance uh, and their work that, that their tremendous work that they've done uh, in the inner cities. Um, I mean, how can we make sure baseball is no longer a second fiddle to, to football and basketball? Because, you know, over the years, we've kind of left uh, lost out on a lot of talent in, in a lot of the inner cities because Baseball's so expensive. Uh, it, it, basketball, I mean, you just need a basketball. Football uh, has been a little bit more appealing to not just that community, but also America as a whole. So how mm -hmm. can we make sure baseball is no longer the second fiddle or the third fiddle in the inner cities? Yeah, I think one thing that we're figuring out, too, with the Players Alliance is that you know, having guys dive back into these communities as players that are figures – um, and really, it, it, and we talked about changing perspectives earlier, like as a player, you change your perspective when you're able to dive back into a community in, in which you understand that they don't have the resources that you had growing up. And I think if we continue to do that more and more, I don't even think it's more about the, the, do, the donations. I don't even think it's more about the, the money factor. I think it's more about the players that are playing in our league. And it doesn't have to be just black players, but if we can get those players diving into the communities and just being able to show face, be able to talk about what makes the game so special to them, what makes the game so cool, why they chose baseball over football, basketball, whatever it may be, you start to, you start to change people's minds. You start to change young athletes' perspective on things. And I know for me, it was the same thing. Like I lived in San Diego, uh, uh, predominantly white community, but when I got the chance to meet a guy like Tony Gwynn and be like, man, there's a dude that kind of looks like me and he's a star on this team and he's such a special personality and even outside of the game, like that changes people's minds and perspectives on things. So I think if we're able to do more of that, and I think if you ask guys in the Players Alliance kind of what's been most eye-opening for them, it, a lot of them will tell you that they haven't had time to go dive into these communities 
uh, before this. And when they finally have now, they start to see the impact that they can make on players. So I think that's that's been something extremely special for me to see. Yeah, 100%. And I think that guys like CeCe Sabathia, Chris Young, and Adam Jones when he's back in the States, I mean, yeah. he, he traveled out just for a Players Alliance event. And, you know, that's how much it meant to him. So, I mean, they're definitely doing a service for the community, no doubt about it. Uh, another aspect, um, you mentioned you did another list. You, you're doing so many things here. It's it's hard to keep track of you, Xavier. You just we need like a leash or something. No, but you mentioned Joey Gallo as one of your top five underrated MOB players, and you emphasized the uh, the two schools of of thought that go with him. Um, and you know, some think he's awful because he's hitting 185, and some think that you know he's got value with you know the defensive run saved in the OPS. So are you a fan of the new school thought of hitting, you know, and and maybe the overall approach at the plate, kind of the all or nothing approach? Well, let me say this. First of all, not everybody has that approach, right? And Joey Gallo is in in a specific area within himself because he can do some things that a lot of, not a lot of other players are going to be able to do. He can strike out with the best of them, but he can hit bombs with the best of them and play defense with the best of them, run the bases with the best of them. So you have to remember there's certain areas, certain categories within a player's game when you can accept some certain things because they excel in other areas. As far as the way of, of hitting it with the new school, I, I'm all for taking advantage of there being more of an emphasis on driving the baseball and being able to take your walks along with taking your strikeouts. Because if you're able to produce in some of those other areas, striking out is going to happen. And if you're if you're telling me the dude is going to be uh, have a, a way to runs created plus of, you know, 144 or whatever, and still be able to strike out at the top percent in the league, like I'm going to take that just because I know he's producing over a long period of time. Um, But you also have to understand the balance within your lineup, right? So if I have a super heavy lineup in the Yankees in which a power is big and I know a lot of strikeouts are going to come with it, do I want to go out and get a Joey Gallo at the trade deadline and add him to my lineup when I know a lot of strikeouts come with the power? For me, that's not going to be the case, right? I'm going to try to figure out how do I go get a guy that's going to give my lineup a little more balance. So I think every team situation is different. Every player situation is different. And our game is evolving. So you have to take those things into account. Absolutely. And I think that was the one criticism that the Yankees got was there's a lot of the same hitters in this lineup. Uh, so we'll see how that that shifts a little bit uh, in, in 2022. And that's, and that's what I mean. Like Gallo, mm-hmm. if you go get a Gallo, it's only going to be – the fans are going to be worse on him because you go get a guy that you expect to do something ridiculous, right? But we already knew what type of player mm-hmm. Gallo was. And if you have a decline, it only it only looks worse from a fan's perspective, right? So he had a decline when he came over from Texas. But say he did the same thing he did in Texas, nobody's going to be complaining about his strikeouts because homeboy's going to be hitting bombs. Mm-hmm. He's going to be driving – he's going to be driving Stanton. He's going to be driving LeMahieu. He's going to be driving Glaber Torres. He's going to be driving all those dudes in. So – we'll see what happens this year that's why i said he was one of my top underrated because if he goes out there and just does his normal thing nobody's gonna be talking about that a hundred percent and that's who he is he's you know a guy who's gonna hit for a lot of power and i think uh yankees fans maybe expected more but you know that that's who he was as a player and speaking of power uh, you had a home run at the at the big league level take me through it and tell me everything that you remember (laughs) from that from that from that dinger Man, I love when people ask me about my my one home run in the big <laughs> leagues, man. No, uh, the uh, extremely special moment. And it's really indescribable because you work so hard to get to one point, right, to get to the big leagues. But then understanding hitting a home run just takes it to a whole nother level. And you almost feel like, man, this is this is ultimately where I belong. This is what I love to do. Think about you dreaming about one thing that you love to do for your whole life. Not even in real life. This is one dream that you've had. Like, you're never going to want to wake up from that dream. And what it felt like was an ultimate dream for me. And to hit that home run, you hit it on the sweet spot. You don't even feel the ball. It jumps off like a trampoline and it goes out. 
and you're just running on cloud nine. You're just jogging around the bases. You don't even feel what's going on. You dap up Perry Hill over at first base, one of the best infield coaches ever. So many gold gloves under his belt. Um, Ichiro was on second. Ichiro, we're talking about Ichiro. He was on second base, comes around to score. I dap up Lenny Harris at third base, all-time pinch hit leader in MLB, come home, Two hand Ichiro. I'm like, no, this is not this is not really happening. Go go into the dugout. Don Mattingly, dap him up. Barry Bonds, my hitting coach. <laughs> my hitting coach was Barry. But not, like, first of all, not even a lot of people can say their hitting coach it was Barry Bonds. And for my hitting coach to be in there, Barry Bonds, give me a hug. Like, just unreal, man. So it just it just reminds you that dreams do come true. Um, and it also makes you work harder, you know, makes you want, want it more. But the moment was just indescribable, man. That's the best way I can describe it. Indescribable is the best. Way. There you go. That's a great way to put it. And um, I mean, you, you're not new to power and we'll get to that in just a second. Uh, but I do want to ask about the, the uh, information that MLB players are handed each and every day. Uh, when you played, were you welcoming to all that information? Did it kind of take you a little bit to understand? Uh, was it overwhelming to receive all those advanced scouting reports as a, or, you know, did you consider them a premier advantage at the time? Cause I mean, as of now, you know, you're out of the game as of now and you're, you're dropping weighted runs created plus on me. So there must be some intrigue with some of the new numbers. I think, yeah, I think the numbers tell you a lot of the story. And I think as a player, and every player is going to be different. Do you want to know more about what this pitcher has done over a certain time? Do you want to know how he might attack you and, and how much information can you take as a player? So for me, I was somebody that could take a lot of information and just pick and choose what I needed to have. Um, you know, I want to go up to the, to the plate knowing as much as I can about a, a certain pitcher and I don't, that doesn't mean I have to retain all the information while I'm up there t looking at a 99 mile an hour fastball. No, that means when I get to O2, I might know where he likes to go with his spots O2 or what he likes to do as far as location and, and you know, what he's going to attack me with. So um, I think that's more the, the, the benefit of how I was able to use that information in today's day and age, there's so much information. I think it's more important for players to figure out what works best for them. And, and it's not easy to come to that conclusion. And I think that's what, that's what you have to learn ultimately is about yourself. What can you take? What can you apply to the game? What can you apply to practice? And I think that's one of the great things about being an athlete is like, ultimately you're learning how to compete with yourself and make yourself better. So if numbers do that, let them do it. Mm -hmm. And on it's gotten to the point right now where I feel like if if players are drafted out of high school and college, it's not much like they're not really missing out because they're still getting educated like never before at the big league level and in, in professional baseball. So it's Definitely. like they're they're taking a life course right there. Um, and obviously, I've never experienced it, but that's just from my point of view. And uh, leading into my next uh, question here, a lot of your commentary for your your podcasts and your videos is directed at maybe the younger player and the younger baseball player. And you've even had a chance to cover uh, the little league world series for ESPN. And so what would you tell a youngster who's maybe, cause th there might be some listening or watching. What would you tell a youngster that's maybe looking, cause I know you did a video on this looking to take their game to the next level. Yeah, man, there's a lot that I can tell youngsters and that there's not just one thing, but I, like, I love to repeat the idea of, you know, working on your weaknesses, man. Like, I think one thing that a, a lot of us have, especially as young, young men is like, we're so focused on doing the things that, that make us good, right? We, uh, if I know I can hit for power, I'm just going to go up to batting practice, hit home runs. Like, no, what's the one thing that you struggle at? And, and how are you going to get better at that thing? Because if there's one thing that you struggle at, that's going to be the knock on you. And I don't want there to be any excuses for somebody to say, I can't do something. If I'm trying to go to the next level, I don't want anybody to say, oh, he struggles with his backhand. He's going to be a liability over at third base. No, now I'm going to, I'm going to lock that in right now. And if I don't know what those weaknesses are, I'm going straight to the people that know me best about my game. So if that's my parents, if that's my mentors, if that's my coaches, my instructors, 
Like, don't sugarcoat me. Let me know what I struggle at or what I need to get better at. So that way I'm focused on that as a top priority before some of my strengths. And, and, it, and once I do that, like, don't, don't deviate from that. So what I'm saying is if I go into the cage and say, I need to work on going the other way, I don't want to go to the other way. Boom, boom. Oh, I accidentally pull one. Okay, let, wait, let me, let me get back to pulling a little bit. I felt good on that. No, do what you said you were going to do as far as working on that weakness train yourself and mentally challenge yourself to stick with that plan. When did you, when did you feel like baseball, when did you feel the team baseball aspect the most? Cause it seems like everybody at one point in baseball is trying to get to the next level. Like for example, you know, the eight year old is, is trying to be the best player on his showcase team and the high schooler is trying to get recruited. The college players trying to get drafted the minor league player you know, it, it, it's looked at as maybe like a self-centered, you know, I'm, I'm trying to make it to single A, then double A, then triple A, then the big leagues. Where does team baseball come into account? Where does like, where, where's the point where you kind of felt like, you know, I love this team and we're all playing kind of for each other. Was that at every level or did it take some time to develop that? No, oh, man, that, that takes so much. I think that's a couple of things. That's a mental struggle because like it's really tough to to not focus on yourself, um, but I tell everybody like if you're a good teammate, a lot of other things will fall into place. So if you kind of put the team first, and as far as that thought process, like you'll do what you need to do. But it's it's tough to do. And one of the first places I really felt that was college, because obviously a lot of those guys with you're more. You're, that's the first time you're with your team more than family, right? So you're spending time with those guys best friends with them, all that stuff. But then you kind of lose that, like you said, in professional, when you get to the pros, when you get drafted and it was tough. So, so you have to try to keep that mindset. But when I ultimately got it to answer your question was Korea. When I went over to Korea to play over there, because I didn't have to worry about trying to stay up in the big leagues. Oh man, I'm going back down to the mileage. I got to get back up. No, I could just focus on, man, I'm on this team. I got a contract. I'm fighting for a championship. I'm not fighting to go to a different team. I'm fighting for a championship with my boys. I don't care if they're Korean. I'm fighting with them to for a championship. This is amazing. We're family. So that was the first time I ultimately felt that and felt comfortable just playing in my own skin. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even when you're at the big league level, there's still some, you know, there's still some, you know, the mindset at the back of your mind, like, you know, MVP voting is, you know, you're trying, to, all -star. trying to prove something yeah. right you're always trying to prove something and i think but to your point the players that are able to kind of block that out the most those are the ones that extreme are able to excel extremely well and come out of it looking really good in terms of terms of legacy and i feel like they get the most out of it yes. uh and i also saw a video of, of you talking about this and i thought it was really cool when you were drafted what was the advice that you said that your, your dad gave you when you were drafted? Oh man, there's, there's a good question. I don't think anybody's ever asked me <laughs> this. Um, but my dad, and he, I mean, he said, don't have any regrets. And it, it's kind of a simple statement, but at the same time, it challenged me. It made me think, man, okay, if I'm going to go into this thing, don't have any regrets. That means don't look back and say, man, I wish I put, five more swings into the cage that day, or I wish I would have took a few more ground balls. No, give every single thing that you have every single day and see what happens. And I think that ultimately hit me because it hit me in a sense with, with baseball, right? To do everything I need to do, but then also relationship wise. And I think a lot of people can relate with this is like, don't take relationships for granted either. Like if you know, you have a connection with somebody like dive into that connection, or if you know, you have a chance to learn more about this Latin player and you're not even extending yourself. No, man, go out. Don't be afraid to do it. And I think that was one thing that challenged me, my personality. It challenged me emotionally. It challenged, challenged me spiritually and physically as a player. And, and I'm, I, I'm so appreciative of that. And, and I'm, I'm, I have pulled up your, your baseball reference page here. And I mentioned the power. I mean, you had some monster power years at the minor league level before St. Louis called you up in, in 2014 for the, for the first time. And 
by the way, way too much time there in Springfield. I mean, I don't know why there's, <laughs> I don't know why there was two straight years of just monster production with no movement uh, in, in Springfield, but that's a different point. Uh, but do you, do you remember where you were when you got the news that uh, you were getting called up to the big leagues? Yeah, man, I was in Omaha. We were facing the Omaha storm chasers, triple a in the playoffs, had no idea I was getting called up, had an idea that I had performed well enough to get called up, but I was a, a six-year free, I was going to be a six-year, seven-year free agent at the end of the year um, and really hadn't had too much opportunity with the Cardinals. So, so that I remember after the game, I think I was over four, a couple of Ks, uh, Pop Warner, who's the third base coach of the Cardinals now, was my manager in AAA, called me into the office I was like, man, um, I was like, he's going to say something about me swinging in the dirt again. O two, 2 always swinging in the dirt, whatever it may be. And I go in there and him and the farm director in there because the farm director were in town and they're looking back at one another and like, you going to tell him, you going to tell him. And I was like, what's, what's going on? And so finally, the farm director tells me, hey, X, you're going you're going to uh, you're going to Milwaukee tomorrow. And I was like, Milwaukee, what? what's going on in Milwaukee? I had to think for a second. I was like, did I didn't get traded or something? No. I, you're saying I'm going to the big leagues. Like I'm going to the show, the show show. And uh, man, it was, it was an amazing moment just because like all the work that you put in all the time that you put in finally gets rewarded. And there's so many people that you think about because there's so many people that contributed to that work, contributed to helping you contributed to the support and I think that's what gets you emotional is like, not just personally, but like a lot of people invested in, in me as a player, as a person, and to be able to tell them, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to do it at the highest level. That was, that just gives me chills thinking about it right now. Seriously though, 22 homers and 91 RBIs warranted a return to Springfield. Then like, seriously, I mean, there had to have been, I have to ask about because I'm, I'm looking at it now. I'm like, how did you not like get the bump? I'm trying to remember. Like, there was like, I was blocked for a while too, because Matt Adams was in front of me and he was doing his thing at a, at a crazy level. Um, I think there was another first baseman that they assigned a triple a contract or something. I don't know what happened, but well, you had an even better year the next year. And you're like, you know what? <laughs> Now is this going to get me out of Springfield? 29 homers and 81 RBIs with an 863 OPS. <laughs> so I, you're out of Springfield now. Yeah. There you go. No, that's funny. And, I, and two, like, that was another eye-opening experience, too, because I really was, like, trying to figure, man, what do I need to do? And, um, like, I tried to I, – I, that's when I assessed, assessed my weaknesses again because strikeouts was always something that was uh, that I had some trouble with. And I said, okay, if I can cut these strikeouts down and take more walks, maybe this is an area where I get on base a little bit more. And I think that ultimately they couldn't deny the on-base percentage and, and the, the OPS at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And after, after in, in 2016 uh, with the Marlins, you went to, you mentioned Korea for a few years. And I always think about when, when players go overseas and this is like, probably everybody else that has seen the movie Mr. Baseball. We always think about that movie with Tom Selleck where he's going to Japan uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and playing and it just kind of at first really out of out of place. Did it take you a little bit to adjust to Korea? It did, man. It and it wasn't so much the baseball. It was more the, the outside because I think one of the biggest things I tell people is like, you know, if I go to the Dominican or I go to Puerto Rico or Colombia, like you still have the same alphabet, right? Like the words are going to be different. It's going to be a different language, but you still have the same alphabet. So you can put some things together like Korea's characters, right? Like, so if I'm looking at a, a building, it's going to be, it could be anywhere from a, a, a steakhouse to like a, a, a CVS. It could be like a, you could be a doctor's office. Like, I don't know what it could be. And so I think that was the one of the biggest things is almost feeling like you're like dropped in a certain place and you're like lost as far as um, communication, as far as reading all those things that you you normally take for granted. Like, I remember, like, I didn't even have a car the first year I was there, but the second year I had a car. The first year I'm looking at the street signs, like tells you what street to turn on, whatever green light, like you can't even read that. That's that almost like takes you back to when you were like a little kid. You don't know exactly where you're going. And so I think that was one of the biggest things is trying to get comfortable with where am I, where do I, where am I trying to go? 
What am I trying to eat? The good thing is you have a translator there. My boy, shout out to Kong, um, Kong Marusol, who is, uh, who's my translator the first year, second year, uh, Ming, uh, Daniel Minky Cho. And those dudes were lifesavers. They helped me go wherever I needed to go, translated 24 seven. I had a kid the second year, um, Zeke, had, he was born in Korea. So think about needing a translator when your son is born in Korea. Like that was huge, man. So uh, shout out to them. And it was, it was tough, but we got, we got through it, man. Best, best time of my life. I can't wait for Zeke to, to tell people that he was born in, in Korea. Like that's going to be yeah. such an awesome story. <laughs> I know, that's going to be incredible. I'm excited for it. Uh, did you pick up on any of the language? Like, I mean, two years there, did you come back with like any, I mean, I'm sure you knew some greetings and like, hello, goodbye, but did you pick up on like any advanced, like of the language? No, zero advanced uh, uh, language I picked up on. Yes, the greetings I have, uh, but the advanced language so, was so tough. And then also I had the translator, so I like weighed on them super heavily. Um, but now looking back, I wish I had did a little bit more um, just because people ask me that question all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's pretty amazing because then you think about it in reverse, so players coming from overseas, like Ichiro coming to the United States mm -hmm. and Shohei Otani and, uh, you know, I, I, you Darvish, I think last I heard is, is speaking like near fluent English, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, so no, it, 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 we talked about perspective earlier. Mm -hmm. Like that's the biggest thing is like, you start to understand how hard it is for guys to come over and, and appreciate what they're able to do once they actually do learn the language. Mm -hmm. And now you're kind of in your your a, a different career in, in terms of in terms of media and broadcasting. And many broadcasters and media today um, are, are former players that had long. A lot of them had highlighted careers. And your career was so much more unique. I, I feel like because you played baseball growing up in California, you played in the Midwest, you played down south of Miami, you played in Korea, Dominican, Mexico, probably a million other places uh, in the minor leagues. How much do those experience help you kind of differentiate yourself from some of the other analysts in the industry who played like, uh, you know, he was a 10 year utility guy at the big league level from South Carolina. So right. how much, how much does that, how, how much does that experience help differentiate you? Man, that's everything. That's literally everything. I just had a conversation with the MLB network a couple of weeks ago, hopefully get an opportunity with them. But they were saying like, they're looking for somebody that has more perspective than your normal 10 year all-star veteran, um, you know, who has a specific look on the game, like no knock to those guys because they're amazing. And they're able to tell us kind of like how to think of it from a, a star level. But most of us are not stars, Steven. Like most of mm -hmm. us are just normal people trying to understand the game and the, the stories and the perspectives and, and what it's like to be a normal player. And I think I can be able to add some value there. Um, I've done a lot of things that a lot of players have not done in this game, most notably traveling to all these different places and being able to have these relationships with these different players. Um, and I'm still young enough to have a lot of those relationships now. Right. So I think that's been one thing that's cool is like knowing that I create a lot of the content that players are able to check out. So they know I'm not just some normal broadcast or normal commentator um, who is just, you know, ripping apart their game. Like, no, my thing is how can we learn from this player's game? You mentioned like my, my audience being a lot of the younger players, like, I want people to know how you can learn from this game, but also why is this dude so special? Why is this game so cool? Why do I love a player like Fernando Tatis Jr.? Um, like, that's why. I, I, I just love being able to do that. Mm -hmm. and, and you had the chance to, to work with ESPN Radio during the postseason, this past postseason. That must have been really, really awesome. So what was that more nerve-wracking going into the game? Was that more nerve-wracking than maybe like putting on the uniform and playing? That was the most nerve wracking I think I've ever been a part of, man. I <laughs> sit back there and like still I'm still thinking about it today, like going to Boston, watching the, the watching the Yankees come into town in Boston and play that wild card game. And I'm and I'm the one talking on ESPN radio. Like, are you serious right now? Like, so it was nerve wracking. But at the same time, 
you know, like anything, when you're prepared, when you know what you're going to talk about, when you when you know the game, like it's almost like get your popcorn ready because we I get to watch this show front and center and I get to talk about it with somebody like that was really one of the coolest things. Um, you know, just being able to say, okay, you know, I'm, I'm having a normal conversation with Dave O'Brien. Like, he, like he's does every sport. He's the, one of the great Dan Schulman too, with the, um, with the, uh, the, uh, the AL, the, the division series with the Rays in Boston. Um, so it was just amazing, man. Amazing experience to think about how far I had come was kind of an idea of like how far you can go in a short amount of time. Yeah, absolutely. And before we wrap up here, uh, you have a gig with MLB network radio too. And I, I listen to MLB network radio all the time and uh, it's dope. you're on in the mornings, right? Yeah. Yeah. Normally Monday, t- Monday, Thursdays from, uh, from seven to 10 AM on seven Eastern to time. 10 AM. So everybody yeah. mark your, uh, mark your, your alarms for seven to 10 AM. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm going to, you know, I have to start listening to you. I, I listen, I catch the radio That might be too early for you. Right. Uh, you know what nothing's too early for me so you know what we're we're gonna i'll or go to get bed. the sxm app and then you can go back and listen too because i'd be fighting with steve phillips in, in the morning there we go steve phillips yeah <laughs> former gm of the new york mets also mm-hmm. the guy who's been in broadcasting for a while uh no but that's great and uh this was a lot of fun xavier i appreciate you coming on and you know having a great conversation no nah, i appreciate you man thanks for having me keep doing your thing best of luck to you and, um, you know, keep creating the things that you love to create, man, because, uh, we need more people like you and, and and doing things that are different, you know, and, and especially for this new wave, this new generation that's getting attracted to the game. Thank you. I appreciate that. And all the listeners could go ahead and follow Xavier Scruggs on Twitter at Xavier underscore Scruggs. And he's also on TikTok and uh, Instagram with the same handle, um, so go, go check him out. A lot of great content there and, uh, a lot more content on Rizzocast to come, uh, go ahead and follow the podcast on Instagram and Twitter at Rizzocast and on Spotify, Apple podcasts, wherever you find your podcast, YouTube, uh, rate us, do whatever you want. And, uh, yeah, so some more episodes coming soon as we get the year underway and see you next time.